Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? Why did you come to this place today? Why are you sitting in these pews? Of all of the places that you could be today, what motivated you to be here? What motivated you to be here? For some, it may be, well, my parents made me come. My parents always make me come, and that's why I'm here. For some, it may be, well, it's what I grew up doing. When I grew up back at home, that, we always went to church on Sundays, so, you know, that's just, that's what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to go to church on Sunday. For some of you, it may be, well, you know, I, uh, I, I got family in town, and so when, when family comes in town, you, you know, I'm, you're just supposed to go to church when they come in town, so that's, that's why I'm here today. What motivated you to be here today? Well, I came today to keep my parents off of my back. Came here today to, to, keep my, uh, to keep my husband off my back, keep my wife from nagging me all the time. Why are you here today? Well, maybe, it's, maybe some would say, well, it's to keep the elders off my back. Maybe for some it's to say to keep my kids off my back. What motivated you to come to this place this morning and to worship God? It has been observed that being inside a church building doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a mechanic. And I'd have to say that's true because I've been in a lot of garages. I've been over there when uh, Scott's been working on my van. I couldn't be a mechanic if my life depended on it. Being in a church building make you a Christian? Does being in a worship service make you a worshiper? You know, just because you are in a worship service doesn't mean you are a worshiper any more than going to work tomorrow actually means that you're working. Can you show up for work and not do any work? Don't answer that out loud for some of you. Can you be there at the workplace and not actually be Working. Well, where are you going tomorrow? Well, I'm going to work. What are you going to do when you get there? I don't know. Not going to be working. Where are you going on Sunday? Well, I'm going to worship. What are you going to do when you get there? Is it possible you can go to a worship service and not actually worship? You know, it used to be, used to be that if you couldn't be here, well, then you just couldn't be here. You couldn't worship God. If you couldn't get to the church building. With the advancement of technology, those who are shut-ins, those who are sick, those who have some reason that they are not able to get out and go to services can get online. And while they cannot be here, they can be here. While they cannot sit in this building, they are able to worship. And yet, with the advancing of technology, just because you are here doesn't actually mean that you are here. You know what I'm saying? Just because you are here, have, have you ever said that to your husband? You ever said that to your husband? Just because you're here doesn't really mean you're here. You know, your body might be here, but your mind, it's somewhere else. You're, you know, I'm talking to you and I can see that, you, that, that your, your eyes are on me, but your mind is somewhere else. You know, you're, you're thinking about fishing. You're thinking about the game. You're thinking about something else. And here I am. You ever said that to somebody? You know, you're, you're here, but your mind is not. With the advancing of technology today, there's a lot of us who can be here. But with our phones and with our other devices, boy, we can, we can be all sorts of other places. We can have our minds in all sorts of other different directions. Why are you here this morning? There are all sorts of motivations that we have for worshiping God. But this morning I want us to focus in 
on what the ultimate focus has to be. What the ultimate motivation is. There is no other motivation that matters. There is no other reason that matters for you to be here today. There is no other purpose that you have to be here today than Jesus. That's it. There is no higher motivation for worshiping today than the Son of God. Why are you here? Of all the reasons that we could list, if we're not here because of Jesus, we're not here for the right reason. I want us to think this morning about worship that is motivated by the Son of God. And I want us to think about every avenue by which we worship. And I want us to realize that every part of our worship has got to be Jesus-focused has got to be Jesus-centered, has got to be Jesus-motivated. And if it's not, we need to back up and evaluate. You know, when we come here on Sundays, it's not just to check it off of our list of things to do. It's not just to say, okay, well, I worship God this week, and now I need to go to the grocery store, and I'll check that off my list, and I got, I, I got, to, drop, I, I got to drop a prescription off at the pharmacy, and I'll check that off my list, and, and, I, and I got to go and uh, take the kids to the ball game, and I'm going to check that off my It's not just something that we check off our list. We're here to worship, and that ought to be motivated by the Son of God. I want us to think about singing. This morning, we need to sing as a part of our worship, and we need to do that because of Jesus. Did you like those verses that were read from Revelation chapter 5 this morning? When you think about the scene in heaven, when you think about what is happening around the throne of God, it is not just to the Father that there is worship taking place. But those verses that are read in verse 9 and in verse 12, where it says, You are worthy, O Lord. Where it says, You are the Lamb of God, and You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory and power. It's talking to the Son of God. When we come together to worship, when we come together to sing, it needs to be Because of Jesus, He is worthy of our singing. When you think about the fact that Jesus is the one who gave us something to sing about, would you be singing in worship if it wasn't for what Jesus did? In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12, the Bible says that Jesus wanted to sanctify us. Hebrews 13 and verse 12, it says, Jesus wanted to make us holy, and so what did He do? In order to sanctify His people with His own blood, the Bible says that Jesus went outside the city and He sacrificed Himself there. What do we need to do? Drop down three verses in Hebrews 13 and verse 15, where the Bible says our response must be that we offer the sacrifice of our lips in praise unto God. Jesus is the reason that we come together to worship. Jesus is the reason that we sing these songs. Jesus is the one who gave us something to sing about. And in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says that when we sing that Jesus is singing with us. In the midst of the assembly, Jesus said, I will sing praises unto you. How often do you think about Jesus sitting down and singing next to you? We sang this morning, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. For His name alone is high. Can you imagine Jesus sitting next to you while we're singing that? Can you imagine Jesus singing the spacious firmament on high? 
proves that there is a God. Can you imagine Jesus singing that? We sang this morning, He gave me a song to sing about. Why? Because singing is something we need to do in worship because of Jesus. When you come together, you know it's different. It's different than what you'll find in the denominational world. You go into a denominational assembly and you don't have to sing. There will not necessarily be a lot of people who are singing. There may be a group who stands in front of the assembly and sings to the assembly, or in some places, in some cases, sings for, on behalf of the assembly. But when we come to the Word of God and we see that God has placed within the worship of the New Testament church congregational singing, singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When we sing together, brethren, we need to sing. And that's not saying we need to sing out loud. That's not saying we need to sing on key. That's not saying we need to sing uh, uh, on the right beat. That's saying we need To praise God. When we come together to sing and we sing hallelujah, praise Jehovah, there doesn't need to be anything else on our heart but the idea hallelujah, praise God. When we come together and sing, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There doesn't need to be anything else on our heart but the thought that Jesus is our friend. When we come together and we sing, He could have called 10,000 angels. There doesn't need to be anything else on our heart than the idea that He died alone for you and me. You know, singing, true singing, requires concentration, requires focus. It's easy to look at the words and the notes. It's easy to sing those words and let them come out of our mouths. It's a whole nother thing for those words to come through our heart first. It takes thought. And that's why the Bible says singing and making melody in your heart. When we sing, We need to sing because of what Jesus has done for us. Because of what He did for us on Calvary. Because of what He is doing for us now. Because of what He did for us in preparing us a place to go in eternity. When we come together to worship, our motivation needs to be to bring praise and honor to our God. But when we give, when we come together, we need to give as worship. And we need to give as a part of our worship and our highest motivation needs to be Jesus. Richard, you did an outstanding job in the words that you used for the contribution this morning. Everything that we have belongs unto God. Not a single solitary thing on this earth, no matter how hard we worked, no matter how hard we labored, nothing belongs unto us. And when we come together to worship, when we give as a part of our worship, we give because of Jesus. Do you know that Jesus gave before He ever asked us to give? Jesus is the enriching one. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 says, Though He was rich, He was in heaven. Though He was rich... He became poor. He came to this earth. Didn't even have a place to lay his head. Jesus gave up his place in heaven. Came to the earth. Though he was rich, he became poor. That though you are in poverty, you might become rich. Jesus is the enriching one. And so when he asked us to give back to him, he first said, I gave myself for you. Jesus, what motivated you to give yourself for us? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus loved us 
and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice unto God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Jesus, what motivated you to give yourself for us? He loved us. What motivates you to worship God? Why are you here today? What motivates us in our giving? When someone stands behind this podium and talks about giving, when these men assemble before us with these baskets, what is it that goes through our hearts and our minds? What is it that motivates us to give? What is it that motivates us before we ever come to this place to write out that check, to pull out our billfold and and to pull out that cash? What is it that is driving us and giving back to our Lord? None of it is ours. None of it belongs unto us. When we give, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus, this shouldn't scare us, this should excite us. That Jesus is watching us. In in, in Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 21, You have the story about the widow and her two mites and when she came and gave her two mites. And in Mark chapter 12 and verse 41, the Bible says that Jesus watched, and the New King James has this word H-O-W in there. Jesus watched how they gave. Not only the rich people, but the widow and her two mites. That Jesus watched how they gave. How? It doesn't say, although Jesus knew, It doesn't say that Jesus watched how much they gave. That's what we think. It's all about the amount. Well, Jesus knows the amount. Does Jesus know how much I gave? Does Jesus know how much you gave this morning? No no matter how we folded it up, you think Jesus knows what was on the inside? You know, have you ever ever taken some cash and you think, well, the, the guy collecting it, if I fold this cash in this certain way, the guy collecting it, he won't know if it's a $5 bill or if it's a $50 bill because he won't recognize this part of the bill. Do, do, do you think Jesus knows what's on the inside of that bill? What's Jesus more concerned about? How much we give or how we give? Jesus watched how they were giving. That ought to motivate us in our worship. To think it's not what the person beside me thinks about what I'm giving. It's not what the man collecting the baskets is going to think when he sees me drop something in the basket. What does Jesus think? And as Richard said this morning, what we give back to God needs to be our first fruits. Notice that when we talk about this part of our worship, it is always called the giving. This part of our worship, I don't believe, has ever been called the holding back. Have you ever noticed that? We've come to the portion of our worship where we are going to hold back from the Lord. That, that, would, that wouldn't be very exciting, would it? But when we pull out our wallet, when we pull out our checkbook, is our heart for worship More about giving and how I can give, or is it more about how much I need to hold back? When we give, brethren, as a part of our worship, let us give. Not grudgingly, not of necessity, but to do so cheerfully because that's what God loves. When we come together to worship, there's no other reason to be here today, no greater reason than Jesus. That not only affects our singing, not only affects our giving, it affects our praying. When we pray to God, we need to pray to God because of Jesus. Our concentration, this part of worship and our prayers is perhaps more personal than any other part of our worship. Because when we come to this part of our worship, we need to be concentrating. Concentrating on the fact that it's Jesus who empowered us. It's Jesus who authorized us to even be able to approach the throne of God. Jesus said in John chapter 14 that you will ask in my name, by his authority, by his power, we have the right to come before God. Think about that. 
If Jesus had not died on the cross, we could not say, My Father which art in heaven. Couldn't say that. But because Jesus has authorized us, because Jesus has given us the power, He has given us the right to come into the very presence of God. When you came here this morning, when you drove to this place this morning, when you walked in this building, there is nothing special, nothing sacred about this building by itself. This building was made out of the same materials that made every other building you've ever seen. All this building was made out of was concrete and bricks and wood and nails and I shouldn't have started the list. All that other stuff that goes into making a building. But when we come into this room, there are some who would call this the sanctuary. To say that this is a sanctified room. This room isn't any different than that room or that room or that room. But when we come into this place. And we say our Father which art in heaven. It is as, it is as if we have been transported. From where we are sitting here physically. To the very throne room of God. And I'm in His presence. And it's because of Jesus and what He did for me that He has given me the right to go there. And when I do that, Jesus is making intercession for me. When I pray to God, Jesus isn't just sitting on the right hand of God and and listening in. Jesus is not just eavesdropping on our conversation. God's not going to look over at Jesus and say, Hey, this is an A-B conversation. See your way out of it. Jesus is interceding for us. Every time, before we, every time we go before God, He is pleading our case in the presence of God. When a man gets up behind this pulpit, he is not praying for us. He is not praying in our place. He is not praying so that I don't have to pray. All He is doing is leading our hearts and minds in prayer. And when we say this is perhaps one of the most personal parts of our worship, it is because this needs to be the part where I, not the man standing behind the pulpit, it is his prayer between him and his God and verbalizing it in a leading way, but this part of my worship is between me and my God. When we pray, we need to pray. We need to be actively involved. Why? Because Jesus is actively involved when we are praying. When it comes to this portion of our worship, when we are studying the Word of God together. When the Word of God is being proclaimed as a part of our worship. It's interesting what people, different people think about preaching. And what different people think preaching ought to be. How the preacher ought to behave. How he ought to speak. How long he ought to speak. How short he ought to speak. How fast he ought to speak. How slow he ought to speak. It's interesting how often individuals think about worship. And the focus is always on the preaching part of worship. Or the focus is always on the preacher and what he's going to do, or what he's going to say in worship. There are five avenues by which we worship God. And the the preaching, the studying, the, the, the teaching of the Word of God, that's just one aspect of it. But when we come to this part of our worship, why do we need to be involved in this? It's not because of the preacher. It's because of Jesus. We ought to be actively engaged, not to impress the preacher... Not to keep somebody from giving us an elbow in the side when we fall asleep. We ought to be actively engaged in this part of our worship because of Jesus. Jesus is the one who is the ultimate teacher. 
Jesus is the one who ought to have preeminence in the worship service, not the preacher, not the man who stands before the, 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 uh, the, the people. The one who needs to receive preeminence at this part of our worship needs to be the Son of God. He's the one who ought to stand out above the crowd. He's the one that ought to be proclaimed and held out before everyone else. And it's not just the preacher's job to do that. It is the hearer's part to do that. A preacher can do all he can to hold Jesus out before a hearer, but it's up to the hearer to decide what part is Jesus going to have in what I'm listening to right now. You see, this book doesn't belong to any man on this earth. This book doesn't belong to any preacher on this earth. This book belongs unto the Son of God, and it's the Son of God who said, He who rejects me and receives not my words, not the preacher's words, who receives not my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Preaching is all about the Son of God. And when we study together, we need to see that it is that Jesus, through His word, is teaching us. We need to be like the Bereans and make sure that the words that are being spoken are the words that Jesus is teaching us. But that requires, that requires not passive listeners. That requires active participants in this study portion of our worship. There are moments in our worship that we may see as passive Some people look at the quiet time during the Lord's Supper or as they might view it, they might term it, the dead time during our worship when there's nothing happening and everybody's quiet, we're just passing these trays. And they may see that as some kind of a passive part of our worship. I need to be as much if not more actively involved in that part of my worship than anything else. But it's the same when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God. While it may be the preacher's job, while it may be his responsibility to stand up and proclaim the Word of God, it is our responsibility to not only hear it, but to be active participants in taking the study of the Word of God and having our Bibles open, having our pens out, having our paper out, to take the, 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 the Word of God with us, not just in our memories. What can you remember about the sermon last week? What can you remember about the sermon two weeks ago? What do you remember about the sermon three weeks ago? Can I go back further than that? I, I got you at last week, didn't I? I didn't have to go back to two or three weeks. I got you like last week. Like, did, did last week have a first day of the week? I don't even remember. Who was preaching? Was I here? Uh, Why don't we remember? A lot of reasons why we don't remember. But if we were actively engaged, we could go back and say, oh yeah, that's what the sermon was about. When we study in our worship, brethren, we need to study. And finally, when it comes time to commune in our worship, we need to do so Because of Jesus. Not because it's the church of Christ and they believe that we ought to do it every first day of the week. We need to commune because of Jesus. He is the remembered one. It's not dead time in our service. It is a live time in our service where we are taking our hearts and our minds back to the cross And the only thing dead about that time is my Savior hanging on that cross. I need to go back there and remember Him. I need to go back there and realize that when I am entering this part of the service, that it's not just me communing with the other people in this building, that I am communing with Jesus. Jesus said, I I will not partake of this again until I partake of it anew 
with you in the kingdom of God. It's hard for us to imagine Jesus in our worship. It's hard for us to imagine sometimes Jesus sitting next to us and singing. Can you imagine Jesus singing? He could have called 10,000 angels. Imagine Jesus singing that next to you. Imagine Jesus singing, but He died alone for you and me. Imagine the basket being passed and you drop something in. How much is Jesus going to drop in if He's sitting next to you in worship? Would you be watching? Would you peek over? What's Jesus going to give this morning? When it comes time to praying, can you imagine Jesus saying, pardon me? Can you imagine while we're praying, Jesus saying, pardon me, I have something I need to do. And Jesus starts running back and forth between us and God as we pray. Can you imagine as a part of the preaching part of our service? Can you imagine Jesus standing up here? Or can you imagine Jesus sitting next to you? And Jesus sending text messages. you believe how long this thing is going? Well, he misquoted that verse. Boy, I'm going to hold him accountable for that. Can you imagine Jesus sitting next to you and text? Can you imagine Jesus sitting next to you and, and writing out the grocery list for that week? Well, let's see. I need to get five loaves and two fish. And I, can you imagine? What, can, what, what is your picture of Jesus in worship? What is your picture of what Jesus would be doing during the sermon? What's your picture of what Jesus would be doing when that tray comes with bread that is an emblem of His body? And when you take a piece and you pass it, and He takes a piece, and you are communing with the Son of God. When we come together to worship, it's not about us. When we come together to worship, it's not about those who are leading in worship. It's not about the preacher. It's all about Jesus. And when we come together to worship, brethren, let us worship. Let us take everything else that demands our time and life and say, this doesn't matter. And let us put our heart focused on the Son of God. Let that be the center of our worship. As we come to the end of this lesson this morning, I want us to be reminded that there may be a lot of motivations to become a Christian and to be saved, But there's only one ultimate motivation to be saved, and that's Jesus. Jesus came and died upon the cross, was buried in that tomb, and on the third day was raised again. Do you believe that with all of your heart? Do you believe He did that? If you believe that with all of your heart, then why don't you decide, you know what? This life isn't about me. This life is about Jesus and decide I'm going to repent of my sins. Forget these sins. He died for those sins. I'm going to turn away from those sins. Confess my faith. Oh, I believe with all of my heart that He is the Son of God. If you believe that, why don't you this morning be baptized? Just like Jesus said to do. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Have you done what Jesus said to do? Have you done exactly what? what Jesus said to do so that your sins could be forgiven. If you've done that, what Jesus calls upon us to do is to live faithfully, serve diligently, worship lovingly every, every day. Can we help you this morning? Can we help you get your life right with Jesus? If we can help you in any way, please come as together we stand and sing.